It's Monday, December 5th. The Supreme Court's conservative majority sounds sympathetic to Christian graphic artists who objects to designing wedding websites for gay couples. The latest collision of religion and gay rights to land at the high court. If she wins, civil rights activists say, a range of businesses will be able to discriminate, refusing to serve black, Jewish, or Muslim customers, interracial or interfaith couples or immigrants. If I understand you, you're saying, yes, she can refuse because there's ideology just in the fact that it's Mike and Harry and there's a picture of these two guys together. Georgia Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock and his Republican challenger and ex-football star Herschel Walker make their final campaign swings today before their runoff election tomorrow. California could become the first state in the country to fine big oil companies for making too much money. A reaction to the industry's supersized profits following a summer of record high gas prices in the nation's most populous state. Governor Newsom and his allies in the state legislature introduced their proposal today at a special session of the legislature focused solely on the oil industry. The city of Los Angeles passes a ban on drilling new oil and gas wells and will phase out existing ones. And tens of thousands of people in North Carolina preparing to go without power for days after two power substations are shot up and what the FBI is calling a criminal attack. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. This week, the United States Supreme Court will consider an elections case that could dramatically alter voting in 2024. A Republican-led challenge is asking the justice for a ruling that could significantly increase the power of state lawmakers to draw congressional districts. The court will hear arguments on Wednesday in a case for North Carolina, where Republican efforts at gerrymandering were blocked by a Democratic majority on the state Supreme Court. The question for the justices is whether the U.S. Constitution gives state legislatures the power to cut state courts out of redistricting decisions, an argument made by the Republicans under a novel new legal theory, independent state legislature theory. Catherine Carley reports. In the case Moore v. Harper, some North Carolina lawmakers are arguing that the Constitution doesn't impose the usual limits on the power of state legislatures when they regulate federal elections. Eliza Swearen-Becker with the Brennan Center for Justice says the independent state legislator theory being argued by conservatives before the Supreme Court this week would be dangerous and permit highly partisan election rules. A state legislature could draw an extreme partisan gerrymander without consequence, something that the state court would otherwise strike down as a legal under the state constitution. That is just as backwards as it sounds. State lawmakers could violate their own constitutions. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. A conservative group that helped wage the decades-long campaign to overturn the constitutional right to an abortion at the Supreme Court is now asking a judge in Texas to ban the sale of abortion pills by mail. Roz Brown reports. The group, Alliance Defending Freedom, strategically filed a lawsuit last month in the court of a Texas judge known for his opposition to contraceptives and same-sex marriage. Carrie Baker writes from Ms. Magazine that the group's claim that the pills aren't safe has been debunked several times. Abortion pills are safer than many over-the-counter drugs like 
Tylenol, yet they're claiming that they're not safe. And I just worry that this judge, who clearly is very political, he will just go along with it. The lawsuit claims the Food and Drug Administration exceeded its authority when it approved mufepristone in 2000. When coupled with another drug, it can be used to end a pregnancy within the first 10 weeks. Abortion pills accounted for 54% of all U.S. abortions two years ago, according to the Guttmacher Institute. The complaint against the FDA argues abortion pills were unlawfully fast-tracked without required research. Baker notes the agency published a 40-page rebuttal letter to those objections, which the Alliance Defending Freedom failed to address in its complaint. The FDA approved the abortion pill in 2000. It's been 22 years. They're still trying to say, oh, you did it wrong, you did it too quickly, you didn't pay attention to the science, and they're just wrong. The Alliance's lawsuit also asks the Texas judge to revive the 1873 Comstock Law, which banned sending information regarding contraceptives and other sexual information through the U.S. mail. Baker calls it an attempt to reactivate zombie laws. They're trying to literally bring back to life these laws that have been dead for decades, that are so antiquated, yet these folks are trying to bring those laws back into effect to take away access to abortion pills. For Texas News Service, I'm Roz Brown. Two African-American men are vying to make history as the first to win a full six-year term in the United States Senate, representing the state of Georgia, tomorrow in a runoff election. Democrat Raphael Warnock is the first black senator from Georgia when he won a special election victory last year. Now he's fighting to keep his seat against Republican Herschel Walker, a former football star turned politician who professes to be anti-abortion, although two of his former girlfriends have said he pushed them into getting abortions. The two men rallied over the weekend in a last effort to get out the vote. Raphael Warnock. The people of Georgia need a true champion. Women need a champion. Workers need a champion. Our kids need a champion. The planet needs a champion. We're on a different field tonight. Reporter Catherine Carley has more. Georgia Secretary of State records show mail-in voting last month fell more than 80 percent compared to two years ago. Observers say that's due to tighter rules imposed by state lawmakers, but both sides are trying to talk up turnout for Tuesday's Senate runoff there, including in Spanish. Hola, Georgia. Soy America Ferrera. Senador Pastor Warnock está en una segunda vuelta electoral. Es por eso que les pido que voten el 6 de diciembre o antes. Actress America Ferrera encourages Georgians to vote for incumbent Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock against Republican challenger Herschel Walker. A win by Warnock would give Democrats a 51st vote in the Senate and reduce the influence of dissenting Democratic Senators Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. For the first time in almost a half century, the state of Iowa will not be holding the first in the nation presidential caucus for Democrats. Mike Moran reports. The National Party has ousted the state from the number one position, but could face a challenge from Iowa law. Iowa cemented its status as an influential state in the political process during the 1976 presidential campaign when a little-known peanut farmer named Jimmy Carter burst onto the national political scene with his folksy charm, moral charisma, and a genuine connection with Iowa farmers. Then governor of Georgia, Carter won the Democratic caucus that year and was elected president. Iowa Secretary of State Paul Pate says since then, Iowa has leveled the playing field for presidential hopefuls. These other states either to the, the big candidate, the newbie, the underdog, the other candidates who perhaps don't have the same kind of resources won't have a chance to be even competitive because of the expense of running for president. Iowa law mandates its caucuses be first in the nation, and the state has weathered challenges to its status before. But the National Democratic Party has never taken official action to name a new first in the nation event until now. Critics of the caucuses have pointed out that Iowa's population isn't representative of the entire country and that the state shouldn't have such an outsized influence. Pate has encouraged the Democratic Party to reconsider ignoring Iowa's prominence in rural America. 
but as the state's top elections official, he must remain nonpartisan in this debate. I don't get to wear a team jersey. I'm the referee, but the referee, I, I want to see the game. I want to make sure we have the game. And in this case, uh, the nomination process is very, very important. National Democrats have said the change is intended to hear the voices of more people. For Iowa News Service, I'm Mark Moran. Republicans returned to Washington today facing a familiar drama that's played out continually in the Trump years. Republican members forced to confront a controversy that they would just rather ignore. After days of silence over former President Donald Trump's call to terminate the United States Constitution, several top Republicans have now condemned his comment. But even among those speaking out, few have said it should disqualify Trump from running again for the White House, where you take the presidential oath promising to defend the United States Constitution. Many more Hill Republicans have so far remained silent on the issue. And in a sign of how reluctant most Republicans are to wade into the latest Trump-driven controversy, most were quiet today until pressed by reporters for comment after returning to the Capitol today from their weekend. Catherine Carley reports. Former President Donald Trump is repeating his false claims about 2020 and posted that a fraud of this magnitude allows for the termination of all rules, regulations, and articles, even those found in the Constitution. That drew a reaction from Republican Representative Mike Turner of Ohio. Well, you know, he says a lot of things, that, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's ever going to happen. So you've got to accept uh, exact fact from fantasy, and fantasy is that the, we're going to suspend the Constitution. Turner's remarks to ABC News and posted online echo those of some, but not all, Republicans. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. The Supreme Court today heard arguments in a Colorado case that could have implications for businesses which refuse service to gay couples on religious grounds. A Christian graphic artist is arguing that she should not be required to design wedding websites for same-sex couples. The court heard a similar case five years ago from a Colorado baker who refused to make a wedding cake for a gay couple based on religious objections. Christopher Martinez reports. While the U.S. Senate was passing a law to protect same-sex marriage rights, across the street, the Supreme Court was considering a case that could undermine LGBT rights. Justice Sonia Sotomayor laid out the significance of the case, known as 303 Creative versus Elenis. This would be the first time in the court's history, correct, that it would say that a business open to the public, as this petitioner has said it is, that it's open, a commercial business open to the public, serving the public, that it could refuse to serve a customer based on race, sex, religion, uh, or sexual orientation. The case from Colorado concerns Laurie Smith, an evangelical Christian website designer who only designs wedding web pages for heterosexual couples. Colorado may not force Ms. Smith to create and speak messages on pain of investigation, fine, and re-education. Kristen Wagner is senior counsel with the group Alliance Defending Freedom, representing Smith and her firm 303 Creative. Wagner says Colorado's law barring discrimination in public accommodations violates Smith's First Amendment rights. But the First Amendment is broad enough to cover the lesbian website designer and the Catholic calligrapher. The line is that no one on any side of any debate has to be compelled to express a message that violates their core convictions. The three more liberal justices on the court challenged the plaintiff's arguments, saying it would create a license to discriminate. Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson offered an analogy, a mall Santa doing nostalgic photos, but only with white children. Precisely because they're trying to capture, capture uh, the feelings of a certain era, their policy is that only white children can be photographed with Santa in this way, because that's how they view uh, the scenes with Santa that they're trying to depict. Now, the business will gladly refer families of color to the Santa at the other end of the mall who'll take anybody. 
but, and they will photograph families of color in other scenes, other scenes. So they're not discriminating against the families. What they're saying is scenes with Santa is preserved for white families and they want to have a sign next to the Santa that says only white children. Colorado Solicitor General Eric Olson argued the case for the defendant, saying the plaintiff's argument is too sweeping. Granting such a license to discriminate would empower all businesses that offer what they believe to be expressive services, from architects to photographers to consultants, to refuse service to customers because of their disability, sexual orientation, religion, or race. The more conservative justices, who make up a two-thirds majority on the court, were much more receptive to the plaintiff. For example, Justice Clarence Thomas. This is not a hotel. This is not a restaurant. This is not a riverboat or a train. Justice Samuel Alito, in his questioning of Olson, offered a hypothetical situation that mirrored Justice Jackson's. If there's a, a black Santa at the other end of the mall, and he doesn't want uh, to have his picture taken with a, a child who's dressed up in a Ku Klux Klan uh, outfit. That, that black Santa has to do that? No, because Ku Klux Klan outfits are not protected characteristics under public accommodation laws. Justice Elena Kagan followed up on that, prompting a joke from Alito. And presumably that would be the same Ku Klux Klan outfit, regardless whether the child was black or white or any other characteristic. Yeah, you, do see, you do see a lot of black children in Ku Klux Klan <laughs> outfits, right, all the, all the time. For the more conservative justices, the key issue seems to be protecting the rights of someone they believe would be forced to express a certain message. For the liberal minority, the case is more about freedom from discrimination, with free speech being used as a tool to get out from anti-discrimination laws. Which theory prevails will become clearer by summer, with the ruling expected by July. Depending on how the majority rules, it could well affect not only LGBTQ rights, but other long-standing precedent barring discrimination. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. New Mexico's LGBTQ community is celebrating passage of the Respect for Marriage Act by the U.S. Senate, but also surprised it came about so quickly. Roz Brown has that story. The bill to prevent discrimination, promote equality, and protect the rights of all Americans is now headed to the House of Representatives for a vote that could come as early as this week. Same-sex marriage was recognized by New Mexico's Supreme Court in 2013, two years prior to a comparable ruling by the nation's highest court. Equality New Mexico Executive Director Marshall Martinez has watched as public opinion about same-sex marriage has changed dramatically. So I saw it happen here, and I saw it happen at the federal level from the court, but I don't know that I would have believed even two or three years ago that an elected body would make this decision, and at the federal level especially. Assuming the legislation passes the House, President Joe Biden has said he looks forward to signing it, saying in a statement, Americans should have the right to marry the person they love. The bill would not require people or organizations to provide marriage services if the ceremony violates their religious beliefs. Martinez says last week's Senate vote was a product of decades of activism. Organizing works. And what we know is that gay and lesbian folks specifically were organizing around marriage equality for such a long time, and that organizing can look so different. But the public support increased because of the organizing. Both of New Mexico's U.S. Senators, Martin Heinrich and Ben Ray Lujan, voted in favor of the Respect for Marriage Act as the Senate passed the bill 61 to 36. This is Roz Brown, New Mexico News Connection. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. California could become the first state in the nation to fine big oil companies for making too much money. Reaction to the industry's supersized profits following a summer of record high gas prices in California, the nation's most populous state. Governor Gavin Newsom and his allies in the state legislature introduced their proposal today as lawmakers returned to the state capitol in Sacramento for the start of a special legislative session focused solely on the oil industry. But the proposal was missing key details, including how much profit is too much for oil companies, 
and what fine they would have to pay for exceeding it. Newsom's office said those details would be sorted out later after negotiations with lawmakers. Any money from the fines would presumably be returned to the public. Gas prices are always higher in California because of taxes, fees, and environmental regulations that other states don't have. But in October, the average price of a gallon of gasoline in California was more than $2.60 higher than the national average, the biggest gap ever. Governor Newsom said there was no good way to justify that. Speaking to reporters, Newsom compared the actions of oil companies to price gougers charging more for hand sanitizer during the COVID pandemic. He said the goal of the penalty is to prevent gas prices from shooting up similarly in the future, calling it a proactive effort in order to change behavior. It could be a popular proposal with the voters who have been paying more than $6 per gallon of gas on average for much of the year, but that doesn't mean it will be easy to get it through the state legislature, where the oil industry is one of the top spenders on both lobbyists and on campaign contributions to lawmakers. Crucially, the proposal classifies the fine as a civil penalty and not a tax, That means only a simple majority would be needed for passage instead of the two-thirds majority that is required to raise taxes. California legislature is in session for most of the year, typically considering hundreds of bills. But the governor can call lawmakers into a special session limited to discussing issues that he specifies. Newsom said he called the special session on gas prices because it would help lawmakers focus on the issue. But the lawmakers don't appear to be in any hurry to pass the bill. They convened in a special session for mere minutes today, long enough to adopt rules and appoint leaders. They won't reconvene the special session again until January 4th. Many lawmakers said they had no idea what Newsom was proposing. A few senators even joined reporters at Newsom's news conference outside Senate chambers just to hear what he had to say. Meanwhile, inside Climate News reports, the oil industry is pushing a referendum to stop a new law limiting where new oil and gas wells can be located in California. The law bars locating oil drilling wells within 3,200 feet of a school, a home, a business, or a park, scheduled to go into effect January 1st. Efforts are underway, though, to gather enough signatures to put the issue before the voters in 2024. They've got, that is the oil industry, until December 15th to collect 625,000 signatures. The industry has spent some $18 million to get those signatures. If they get it on the ballot, it would freeze enforcement of the new law, allowing oil companies two full years to expand or to continue drilling wherever they want. Reports are surfacing that petitioners are lying to the public about what the referendum would do. They're saying it would ban oil drilling near their homes and schools. Political watchdogs are urging reforms, meanwhile, to the state's referendum process. The Los Angeles City Council has voted unanimously to ban the drilling of new oil and gas wells and to phase out existing ones over the next 20 years. The vote comes after more than a decade of complaints from city residents that pollution drifting from wells was affecting their health. City Council President Paul Krikorian. Hundreds of thousands of Angelinos have had to raise their kids, go to work, uh, prepare their meals, go to their neighborhood parks in the shadows of oil and gas production. You know, in exposed to the toxic chemicals and fumes and noise and all of the other uh, dangerous interruptions of their health and their quality of life in the very shadow of oil derricks. And so to most of us, that seems unthinkable. 
Researchers from the University of Southern California in a study in 2021 found that people living near wells in two Los Angeles neighborhoods, University Park and Jefferson Park, reported significantly higher rates of wheezing, eye and nose irritation, sore throat, and dizziness than neighbors living further away. Both of those communities are predominantly non-white with large black and Latino communities. Councilmember Mitch O'Farrell says L.A., the second largest city in the country, is also leading the fight on climate change and a just transition off of fossil fuels. We always have an outsized opportunity to not only set a national but a global standard and precedent for how we can achieve clean energy to mitigate the effects of climate change. In Los Angeles, we're moving toward achieving a 100% carbon-free Los Angeles by 2035. The city of Los Angeles is moving into a new era with this vote today, and we will no longer tolerate oil and gas extraction. No matter where people live, everyone deserves to breathe clean air, drink uncontaminated water, and live in safe, healthy neighborhoods. The push to ban drilling in the city of Los Angeles is part of a region-wide effort to shut down oil and gas extraction throughout the county of Los Angeles, with similar measures covering Culver City and unincorporated parts of L.A. County passed in 2021. According to the city controller's office, there were 780 active and 287 idle oil and gas wells within city boundaries in 2018. A pilot project is underway in the Pacific Northwest to relocate Native American communities dealing with rising waters resulting from global warming. Antonia Gonzalez reports. The Interior Department is putting $75 million toward community relocation efforts for three tribes in Alaska and Washington state that are struggling with the consequences of a changing climate. We've never really done anything like this before uh, in this country, uh, particularly uh, for tribes. Brian Newland is the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. He says the Interior Department hopes to capitalize on some of the progress New Talk Alaska has already made and develop a blueprint for the federal government's future response to climate change. You know, we want to make sure that we are gaining experience on the federal side of things, working with tribes to do climate relocation work. Newland says the department weighed a lot of factors in deciding how to allocate the money. We evaluated a number of communities that um, have gone through some of our climate funding programs before, and we uh, weighted a number of different factors like readiness, um, need, existing plans, as well as our ability to Uh, glean lessons learned. The tribes will also receive funding from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Eight other tribes across the U.S. will share $40 million to assist in planning for climate change mitigation. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. And this is the evening news. You're listening to it on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, perhaps online at KPFA. Org. It's an hour-long newscast without interruption that airs each night at 6 o'clock with a half-hour edition on the weekends. All our newscasts available online at kpfa.org. They're also available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. The Russian military says it shot down Ukrainian drones that attacked two Russian air bases today and three Russian servicemen were killed by debris from the assaults. It said four other Russian soldiers were wounded by fragments from the drones that were intercepted at bases in the Saratov and Ryazan regions some 300 miles from the Ukrainian border. The defense ministry added that two Russian aircraft were slightly damaged by the drone fragments. Ukraine has not commented on the possible cause of the blasts at the Russian bases, which could have come from missiles based inside Ukraine or Ukrainian or Russian saboteurs working inside of Russia, closer to the bases. 
Meanwhile, Ukrainian officials report a new barrage of Russian missile strikes across their country that have cut power to millions of Ukrainians. Media reports referred to explosions in several parts of the country, including the cities of Odessa, Cherkasy, and Kiev. Here's a spokesperson for the United Nations who did not identify herself. In Odessa, the water supply has been compromised due to the lack of electricity to run the pumps, and the heating system in Dnipro and Odessa have also been impacted. In addition, 40% of the Kiev region was left without electricity, according to authorities. Our humanitarian colleagues note that the attacks have further damaged Ukraine's energy system at a time when temperatures have dropped below zero in most of the country and reached minus eight degrees in Kyiv. These repeated attacks on the energy system are putting millions of civilians at risk of freezing temperatures. The UN spokeswoman says they're providing generators to Ukrainian hospitals and other civilian infrastructure. A spokesman for the Ukrainian Air Force said Russia launched the attacks by land-based missiles from southern Russia and shipborne missiles from the Caspian and Black Seas. The G7 group of leading industrialized nations, the European Union and Australia, have agreed not to facilitate the export of Russian oil unless it's sold for $60 or less a barrel. The EU also banned all seaborne imports of Russian oil. The Kremlin says Russia is rejecting any cap on its oil prices and is preparing an official response to the Western sanctions policy that came into force today. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov described the policy as destabilizing global energy markets and, in response to a question from reporters, said the oil price cap would not affect Russia's ability to finance the war in Ukraine, which Western powers say it's intended to do. Peskov said Russia's economy has the necessary potential to fully meet all the needs of its special military operation, using the Kremlin's official term for the war. Brian Edwards Teekert, host of KPFA's Upfront Morning Show, discussed the Russia oil price cap with John Pfeffer, Director of Foreign Policy in Focus for the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington. You know, it, it's going to be difficult to impose. Um, I mean, well, first of all, the $60 uh, still allows Russia to make a profit. It basically uh, it costs about $20 to produce um a barrel, and so sixty dollars gives it you know the opportunity to make you know uh, somewhere along the lines of um, uh, you know a hundred billion a year, which is a lot of money. Um, and so that's why Zelensky's not happy. I mean, the, and some of his Eastern European partners are not happy either. Would have preferred it closer to you know a, a break-even point for Russia. Um, it's also going to be tough to impose um, the actual price cap that in itself is impossible to impose. The only way to impose it is for the shippers, basically the tank, the, the maritime companies to refuse to uh, uh, to deliver the product if the price um, is uh, above $60. Um, but even if, you know, that were perfectly implemented, even if you could get all of the shipping companies around the world to agree to this, you could still have arrangements in which a purchaser, for instance, let's just say um, that, uh, you know, uh, Malaysia wants to buy uh, oil from Russia uh, and it has agreed to, you know, to, to meet the $60, even though Russia wants to charge it more. Malaysia can simply pay more for some other item that it is purchasing from Russia. And then, you know, basically it comes out to, um, to what the asking price for Russia was in the first place. Um, the other issue, of course, is that Russia was selling its uh, oil for discounted rates to some countries like China and India in the first place. So um, it's, 
it's more of a of a signal to Russia um, that uh, you know that the West is not happy with, obviously not happy with uh, with the war, but also with the way Russia has been using fossil fuel um, sales as a way to kind of put pressure on the the supporters of Ukraine, and especially uh, countries in Western Europe. The independent Russian language publication Medusa, now publishing from Latvia, reports that Russia's ongoing military defeats in Ukraine and the social burden of Russia's ongoing mobilization are rapidly cooling Russia's public support for the war. Medusa says it gained access to the results of an opinion poll commissioned by the Kremlin for internal use only. And according to that study, conducted by the Federal Protective Service, the FSO, 55% of Russians favor peace talks with Ukraine, while only a quarter of the respondents still support continuing the war. The FSO poll does not diverge all that much from the results of an October public opinion study conducted by the Levada Center, Russia's only large independent sociological institute. In the Levada study, 57% of respondents said they supported or would probably support peace talks with Ukraine, and only 27% expressed the same range of support for continuing the war. John Pfeffer of Foreign Policy and Focus. I mean, I, I tend to believe that this is credible. I mean, based on um, kind of the the general tenor of uh, of you know reporting from within Russia, um, and kind of the the evidence we get from bloggers and from social media and so forth, um, you know the the public opinion has turned substantially against this war um and it's turned against this war in kind of direct proportion to uh russian battlefield um uh, failures to be honest i mean it, people in russia have seen what's happened the information has leaked through um it's been kind of presented by the russian government in various you know um different forms that that that, that it's not defeat, but it's strategic withdrawals, et cetera. But Russians are not stupid. They know what's going on, and uh, they don't want this war to continue. Um, now, of course, there's still a tremendous amount of nationalism inside Russia. I mean, it, this poll doesn't mean, if it's correct, that um, that Russians have, say, changed their mind about the importance of greater Russia or some of the other kind of um, formulations coming from the Putin administration. But narrowly speaking, they don't think that this war is the best way of achieving that, um, given the obvious failures on the ground. Um, now, how the Russian government is going to respond to that? Mm, well, that's a different matter. I mean, it doesn't seem that public opinion plays that great a role uh, in kind of the Putin administration's formulation of policy. Um, but over time, mm, it will have an effect. Um, it can't help but have an effect. Uh, but what kind of effect, that remains to be seen. It's possible that the Russian government will you know, somewhere down the line in a few months, become a little bit more receptive to negotiations. Uh, in other words, kind of retract some of its harder line demands, uh, uh, acknowledging uh, that there's really no public support any longer for the most, um, the, the kind of maximalist um, positions of the Kremlin. John Pfeffer directs Foreign Policy in Focus for the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. There are some increasing signs that Europeans are beginning to feel that they may be bearing a disproportionate share of the cost of the war in Ukraine, especially when it comes to the war's disruption of the international oil market and the rising cost of energy. Simon Marks has that story. 
When President Emmanuel Macron of France visited Washington last week, he was at pains to point out that Europe's energy crisis, caused in large measure by Vladimir Putin's war on Ukraine, is far more intense than America's. Analyst Jim Lindsay with the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations. Some leading Europeans complain that, in their view, the United States is actually profiting off the war by selling a lot of weapons. That is, American companies are producing weapons used in Ukraine. You're also seeing the argument that the rise in the price of oil is benefiting big American oil companies. We're about to head into winter. Europe is facing a winter in which its energy supplies are not as secure as Europeans want it to be. And one of the great fears is that you could have an epically cold winter, and that could put tremendous pressure on European governments as they're unable to deliver what their publics expect, and that could tear at the fabric of the Western alliance. In a fresh bid to defend European energy consumers, a price cap on Russian oil is taking effect on Monday, aimed at stopping countries from paying more than $60 a barrel for Russian crude. The U.S. says the move will impact the Kremlin immediately. With FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marks. Two power substations in a North Carolina county were damaged by gunfire in what's being investigated as a criminal act. A spokesman for Duke Energy said at a news conference with local officials that the damage caused the night before could take days to repair. Power was out for roughly 35,000 customers as of this morning, down by several thousand from the peak of the outages on Sunday night. Moore County Sheriff Ronnie Fields. We're looking at all avenues. Uh, that's the reason I've got the professionals, the federal folks. Uh, they deal with the domestic terrorism more than locals. Uh, so they're on board and, and they're working with us uh, to, to determine exactly uh, who done this. Now I can say this, this individual that done this it was targeted. It wasn't random. Some speculated the attack was to shut down a drag show in Moore County. Sheriff Field says authorities have not determined a motive, but it appeared gates were breached at both sites and that the attack was deliberate. Jurors continued their deliberations today in Harvey Weinstein's rape trial in Hollywood. The 70-year-old former movie mogul is charged with raping and sexually assaulting two women and committing sexual battery against two others. He's pled not guilty. Meanwhile, he's serving already a 23-year sentence for sexual assault in New York, faces 60 years prison time if found guilty on the counts in California. A trial is underway for a former Border Patrol agent charged with killing four women. Jurors in the capital murder trial heard 39-year-old Juan David Ortiz confess in a taped interview to killing four sex workers in South Texas. If convicted, he faces life in prison with parole because prosecutors are not seeking the death penalty. Ortiz was a Border Patrol intelligence supervisor at the time of his arrest in September of 2018. Jurors heard the taped confession last week. The bodies of the four women were found along roads on the outskirts of Laredo in 2018. Each woman shot in the head and left along the roads on the outskirts of the town in September. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Brian Edwards Teekert from Upfront. When we're running down a story or an idea or a debate, we follow our research wherever it takes us. We've interviewed everyone from the head of California's Republican Party to an insurrectionist making the case for property destruction. The thing I love about this job is the moment when we ask a question and you can hear the person on the other end thinking. They are off their talking points. You don't know what's going to come out next. Sometimes it's profound. Usually it's interesting. That's why when the news moves fast, we take the time to go deep. It's up front at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on KPFA.
The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the American Medical Association said today that the RSV, flu, and COVID viruses represent a virus triple threat this holiday season and urged Americans to get up to date on their vaccinations. KPFA's Pamela Estrada reports. According to CDC data, COVID-19 hospitalizations were at their highest level in three months. More than 35,000 patients are being treated. Meanwhile, more than 20,000 people were hospitalized for the flu over Thanksgiving week. That's almost double the previous week's count. The CDC says children under five, pregnant women, people with underlying health conditions, and seniors are the most at risk from these diseases. Rochelle P. Walensky is director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. She said the CDC is seeing lower rates of vaccination compared to this time last year. She said the holidays are an especially risky time for the spread of viruses. In the past week, we have started to see the unfortunate and expected rise of COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations nationally after the Thanksgiving holiday. This rise in cases and hospitalizations is especially worrisome as we move into the winter months when more people are assembling indoors with less ventilation and as we approach the holiday season where many are gathering with loved ones across multiple generations. Walensky urged people to get caught up on their vaccinations. She said vaccines lower the risk of infection and reduce the risk of severe illnesses and death. She also recommended people cover their coughs and sneezes, avoid sick people, and stay home if you get sick. Other everyday preventions include washing your hands and improving ventilation in your home and workplaces. The CDC continues to recommend masking for anyone traveling on public transportation. The CDC also recommends people talk to their health care providers. Dr. Sandra Freyhofer is board chair of the American Medical Association. She said over the last few years, COVID prevention measures helped prevent the spread of the flu and other respiratory infections. But she said that is no longer the case, and flu shots are again highly recommended. Uh, This year, all flu vaccinations are quadrivalent, meaning they cover four strains of flu, two flu A's and two flu B's. And different flu strains can circulate within the same flu season. Right now, we're seeing outbreaks of influenza type A. And the only thing worse than getting flu once in a season is getting it again, and you can So even if you've already had flu this season, you should still get vaccinated once you recover from the acute illness to keep you from getting it again with a different flu strain. Health officials say vaccines are crucial in the fight for health this holiday season and say anyone six months and older is eligible for vaccination. For KPFA News, I'm Pamela Estrada. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is calling on the Department of Health and Human Services to be ready to intervene to help hospitals that may be overwhelmed by RSV, flu, and COVID cases. I'm calling on them to be ready that if any hospital in New York says, we're short of doctors, we're short of nurses, we're short of respirators, we're short of beds, that they can come and supply those things immediately. Schumer said some upstate New York hospitals need extra support right now, and he wants the feds to make arrangements now so that providers in the area can pull professionals from neighboring states like Pennsylvania if they need to. The flu, COVID, and RSV are rapidly spreading in the state of Kentucky, and health experts say that that's a problem there for hospitals, schools, and the state's vulnerable residents. Nadia Ramlagan reports. So far, more than 20 school districts have temporarily halted classes due to RSV. At Norton Children's Hospital, Dr. Robert Blair says respiratory viruses spread primarily by airborne droplets from coughing and sneezing. He explains premature babies and young children with congenital heart disease, reactive airway disease, or asthma are particularly susceptible to RSV. They can wind up in the hospital on a ventilator, so he encourages families to do everything they can to stop the spread of the virus. We need to pay attention to people who are sick and isolate them and support them and encourage them to mask and take care of themselves and get medical care. And these little babies that are very, very high risk need to not be exposed to people with colds. 
The American Academy of Pediatrics and Children's Hospital Association has asked President Joe Biden to declare a federal emergency to provide more support to combat the nationwide surge in pediatric hospitalizations driven by RSV and the flu. Blair says normally newborns' immune systems come into contact with RSV, but he points out that babies born during the pandemic lockdowns didn't have that exposure. And so here they are, two or two and a half or three years old, and they're catching these virus infections for the very first time, and their immune systems have not really been primed well. Kelly Talby with Kentucky Voices for Health adds that COVID precautions can help stop the spread of all viruses. Emphasis on hand washing, social distancing, covering your cough, staying home when you're sick, even if it just seems like mild cold-like symptoms. As we've seen, a lot of those precautions lapsing, those, those public health policies that were in place during the pandemic early on. We've seen a surge of all of these diseases, and RSV is among them. There currently is no FDA-approved vaccine for RSV, although clinical trials are ongoing. But Talby says flu shots are easily accessible in every county and are effective at preventing illness, especially among young children, people 65 and older, or those at risk for serious complications. This is Nadia Ramlagan for Kentucky News Connection. Pfizer is asking U.S. regulators to authorize its updated COVID-19 vaccine for children under the age of five. The youngest tots already are supposed to get three extra small doses of the original vaccine as their primary series. Pfizer and its partner, BioNTech, said today that if the Food and Drug Administration agrees, the updated vaccine would be used for the third shot in the series. The FDA has already cleared COVID-19 vaccines tweaked to better target Omicron as boosters for everyone five and older. Restaurant and business groups said today they've gathered enough signatures for a ballot measure that would overturn California's new law that would mandate $22 an hour for fast food workers. Labor groups said the signatures are not valid. Max Pringle reports. Governor Gavin Newsom signed AB 257 into law in September. It was set to go into effect in January. Soon after that, industry groups set about undoing it. They formed a coalition called Save Local Restaurants and had until Monday, December 5th, to submit roughly 623,000 California voter signatures to put a measure on the 2024 ballot that would overturn the law. The coalition which has been spending heavily on the referendum, said Monday that it had submitted more than one million signatures. They've argued that the law will hurt small businesses and end up costing consumers more money. But unions, fast food workers, and their supporters said the effort to undo the law was not being led by small business owners, but by big corporations. Mary Kay Henry is president of the Service Employees International Union. In truth, this is not about local restaurants. This is a corporate power grab. It is abhorrent that these corporations have already spent millions of dollars in an attempt to deliberately mislead California voters and stamp out the progress fast food workers have won. Good government groups argue that this signature gathering effort is an example of wealthy, powerful interests abusing the state's referendum process. Trent Lang is executive director of the California Clean Money Campaign. Corporations and billionaires can buy their way onto the ballot by using unlimited amounts of money to hire mercenary signature gathering firms and circulators, many of them from out of state, and then spend tens of millions more to confuse voters into voting their way. It's expected to take weeks for California's Secretary of State to review and validate signatures and determine whether the referendum can move forward. A UC Berkeley Labor Center study showed that fast food workers are more likely to live in poverty and that 80% of them are people of color and two-thirds are women. Meanwhile, the oil and gas industry is reportedly in the process of gathering signatures to undo a recently signed environmental law that prohibits new oil wells from being built within 3,200 feet of homes, schools, hospitals, and other sensitive areas. They have until December 15th to gather the 625,000 signatures necessary to qualify for the 2024 ballot. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. Dozens of San Francisco residents rallied outside San Francisco City Hall this morning, along with several progressive supervisors, 
to oppose the police use of robots to kill suspects in certain situations. The supervisors passed the policy as part of the police use of military equipment last week, but Supervisor Dean Preston says the use of lethal robots was included at the last minute without any public comment or scrutiny and should go back to the committee for a public hearing. He spoke to Kat Brooks of KPFA's Law and Disorder show this morning. The police department has tried to distinguish between saying these aren't uh, robots that would be capable of actually shooting uh, weapons, but they say uh, that they could be used, uh, a a bomb could be uh, delivered by one of these robots and exploded. So, I mean, we're talking about uh, police using robots to inflict deadly force. Uh, That's what this policy would authorize and hoping that we can prevent this uh, from being adopted on Tuesday. The San Francisco supervisors are scheduled to take a final vote on the police use of military equipment, including the robots. Tomorrow's board president, Supervisor Shaman Walton, spoke against the move today on the steps of City Hall. To militarize a local police department that was given 272 recommendations from the Department of Justice to reform, make changes, to learn how to de-escalate, to do everything they can to come up with the ability to not use lethal force. So the fact that we would decide that now is the time to militarize a local police department that has been under the gun, no pun intended, from the powers that push you to make better decisions doesn't make sense. The supervisors say there needs to be a thorough public hearing with time for public input. Supervisor Preston sent a letter to Mayor London Breed urging a public hearing, noting California law requires the agency to seeking to use the military equipment to post its intent on its website at least 30 days prior to any public hearing. The letter says the policy was posted only three days before a hearing of the Rules Committee last month. South Africa's ruling African National Congress Party says it will vote against any attempts to impeach President Cyril Ramaphosa in Parliament tomorrow. Ramaphosa took legal action today to challenge the parliamentary report that suggested he may have broken anti-corruption laws by having a large sum of dollars at his Fala Fala farm and not reporting its theft. The report recommended that Ramaphosa be impeached. It was drafted by an independent panel appointed to probe allegations leveled by the country's former intelligence head, Arthur Frazier, that Ramaphosa tried to cover up the threat of an estimated $4 million from his ranch. Frazier accused Ramaphosa of money laundering and violating the country's tax and foreign exchange control laws. ANC Treasurer General Paul Maschettili said the ANC will vote against the report because it would set other processes in motion, like impeachment. The NEC resolved that the NEC will vote against the adoption of the report of the Section 89 panel, given the fact that the report has now been taken on review by the president. Ramaphosa is facing calls from his detractors within the party and from opposition parties to step down as a result of the report. He's denied any wrongdoing, claiming that the money was from the sale of animals on his farm and that he had reported the matter to the head of his presidential protection unit. The ANC's National Executive Committee is the party's highest decision-making body and has the power to force the president to resign. Morning rain showers are predicted for the San Francisco Bay Area with highs from the low to the mid-50s, mostly cloudy in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs in the upper 50s, morning clouds and afternoon sun for the Los Angeles area with highs in the low 60s. That is it for the news tonight for this Monday, December 5th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening.
Tune in Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today with host Walt Turner. At 8 p.m., it's Transitions on Traditions, a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power that comes your way with host Greg Bridges. At 10 p.m., end the night right on Don't Disturb This Groove with host Computer Blue. That's Monday nights on KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Thank you.